You're listening to the Kingdom Project Podcast. These are discussions on biblical theology and interpretation. The emphasis is on context and grace. The goal is to promote biblical literacy by displacing and debunking most modern interpretations. The challenge is to engage in healthy conversation that may stretch, but sharpen iron. This is The Kingdom Project, and I'm your host, Marcus Hall. All right, so last time we gathered, uh, we went, we, we sort of paused and went back and went back to, to, uh, to Romans 8.1 before we moved forward. Um, before that, we had seen uh, Paul's analysis of the present suffering and future glory which he said cannot be compared to each other, and that the spirit of adoption is something that everyone who has faith in Christ receives, becoming an heir as children of God. So uh, today we're going to be looking at 8, 18 through 30, and um, I'm not alone. Uh, I'm in good company when I say a bulk of these, the next... You know, well, a lot of Romans is just very hard sometimes, uh, and there's great debate sometimes on certain certain uh, uh, texts, and then to others that there's not. Everyone can agree on it, all right. But uh, I'm going to, uh, as I always do, give you guys some, uh, the different interpretations. But uh, I'll explain myself a little bit more here in, in a moment. But uh, uh, for for uh, sometimes it, some of those can be a stretch to some people or hard to grasp, um, uh, and then but I will stick with the what is the normal, <laughs> I guess the normal interpretation. All right, so we're going to look at eighteen through twenty five first and read that uh, all in one section um, before we go on. It says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Okay, so I'm, go- I'm going to just tread lightly here to not be so stern uh, <laughs> on uh, ha- or how I may come across sometimes on context, context, context. And the reason for that is that the arguments within the commentaries boil down to a couple of things here. It boils down to whether this text is dealing with rational creation or irrational creation. And the majority of commentators see this as referring to irrational creation. And they say that the creation is seen here in a metaphorical way and that it is apocalyptic language. So, of course, we read this and we, we see that for the creation was subjected to uh, futility and it says whole gr- creation groans. So the world, it's the earth, right? is what uh, a lot of people uh, say. And there's nothing wrong with that. I, I, I don't believe that there is. Um, except for when you start to go a little deeper, and, <laughs> and that's when some I start to get tripped up. So when Paul mentions suffering, or sufferings, in verse 18, it's a term for suffering that's used uh, in particular for persecution, and it's use of the sufferings of Jesus. Uh, in Hebrews 2.10, it's used for the sufferings of Christ. In 1 Peter 5.9, it's used for persecution. 
So it talks about hostilities against the gospel of Jesus, and which is uh, hostility, uh, hostilities, not hospital, hostilities against the gospel, against Christ. So Paul said this, this suffering was of this present time, right, as well. So the present time is this juncture of history, right? Uh, so what's the present time for Paul as he's writing that? that moment right that time it is that age this age of this transition period in which they were in all right and that's the contrast we've seen many times throughout the new testament those two ages in contrast this age and the age to come the new testament writers lived in the age that they refer to as this age and to them the the age to come was the future but it was very near because this age, that age, they, the age they lived in was about to end, the old covenant age, right? We've gone over this before. Some, still today, we read that and take that phrase, this age, and apply it to right now and look to the age to come as the second coming. When Christ comes, the new heavens, new earth, those things. Uh, and which I, I, I think is uh, inaccurate. However, I, I can see the application there. So Paul says that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Now, even though that would be his present time, it's still applicable to us. But he says it's to, to be is about to be. And it's interesting, there's been a very big debate on facebook this week on that word that greek word I don't, do you follow gary damar yeah. yeah you see he was like i will send a pdf to anyone who sends me their email on the word mellow and i mean it's a massive uh, this guy has spent 25 plus years not gary but his friend of his working on the word mellow uh in in the word and mellow is soon or about to be or uh, about to take place and all these things and it's been um, misused and mistranslated and all this uh, through through the through the years but it's uh, sometimes it's is about to be and then sometimes is to be is about to be which is an urgency it's imminent all right so Paul was writing to his first century audience that this glory was about to be revealed okay so I'm going to be short and blunt with the first way to view this through the lens of context. And then I'm going to just go along with the majority because it's still it's applicable to us. <laughs> and it's it's still uh, there's nothing wrong with it. OK, so we remember the contrast, right, that we have seen going through Romans, Adam and Christ, right? The body of Moses, the body of Christ, the old and the new. So here we have this, a group of people living in this transition period that I have mentioned is comparable to the Exodus, right? And this is a second Exodus type, if you will. They're living in a time that's battling the body of Moses, which is the law, with the gospel and Christ. And they're waiting for that age to come. It's the fullness of the new covenant age. So we have this word creation here used by Paul that many will take as physical creation. Uh, however, with everything in context that's been considered, it leads some of us to think that he's talking about Israel in that. So the eighth chapter of Romans discusses the role of the Spirit in setting believers free from the law to serve God through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And it, it, it compares the action of those and dwelt with the Spirit to those who do not have the Spirit. And in looking at the all, um, overall context, one would just have to ask why Paul would just all of a sudden interject this uh, allegorical passage about physical creation in a chapter that is pretty much devote, devoted solely to a discussion of the role of the Spirit in the life of believers versus unbelievers. Therefore, the overall context of the chapter suggests that Paul's not talking about this, this irrational creation, right? One, one could even argue that Israel was subjected to futility as well 
which means the inability to reach the goal of its intended design. That's what that word means. So, it, therefore, it cannot achieve what it was intended for. It was not able to fulfill its pur- purpose. It can't be uh, what God intended it to be. And Paul has said that Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind in Ephesians. That this anxious longing then and eager waiting were for the revealing of the sons of God. So what they are looking for is for God to reveal those who are his true children. In the First Testament, Israel is frequently identified in both the singular and the plural as God's son. But in the New Covenant, it's no longer a racial or group of people. The sons of God are those who have faith in Jesus. And the Jews persecuted the Christians, but, but God said, cast out the bondwoman and her son. In Galatians, uh, we've gone over that, and this is physical Israel who has no heirship. It is the brethren, Christians, who are the children of God. And then at the end of that age, at the end of the old covenant age, and then when the temple was destroyed, Jerusalem was raised, uh, God cast out the bondwoman and her sons and made it clear to all the world that those who believe have faith in Jesus, the Messiah, are the true sons of God. Now, if that is all the case, is, is all the case what does it mean in verse 23 when, when it says, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. Well, we ourselves are the New Testament saints, and Paul says that they had the first fruits of the Spirit. And that's what all that means. So that's all I'm going to point out when it comes to that. And I think it's an interesting take and a way to look at it in context. Uh, and, but we'll move on now to the, the, uh, the more traditional view and that still has this application. So Paul, then he says, for I consider, uh, the, see, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. So Paul considers that creation itself is eagerly waiting the revealing of, sons, of the sons of God. And it's because the creation was subjected to futility on account of man's sin, right? That's the way it's uh, usually uh, explained. And therefore, it will benefit from the ultimate redemption of men. Only God could subject creation to hope. And this was not ultimately the work of either man or the devil, but this benefits not only the children of God themselves, but also all of creation. Until that day, then it groans and it labors with these birth pains. And since we have tasted the glory to come by being saved and receiving the Holy Spirit, we groan as well. Although there is a sense in which we all are already adopted, there is also a sense in which we wait for this consummation of our adoption, which happens at the redemption of our body. Now you get into resurrection or the last day or the any any of that stuff, and uh, you know I don't usually. It, it's just I die. There it is. Now 100 percent in the glory of, of the Lord, and uh, may, maybe uh, maybe I'm dead for a thousand years and then I'm raised, or maybe I'm just go right to it too. I don't know. <laughs> Either way, I choose to just go, I'm going to be with the Lord when I pass, and there it is. It's been fulfilled, that consummation. Now I'm fully adopted. There it is. All right? Because we know that God does not ignore our physical bodies in his plan of redemption. The the plan is to be, uh, uh, for the body is, is resurrection when it says this, the corruptible must put on the incorruptible, the mortal must put on Immortality in First Corinthians, uh, how that goes about, and what it looks like, many of us can't say. Many would like to debate on it, but uh, I, I'm usually like, okay. <laughs> so the fulfillment of our redemption is something that still distant. They would say that yet we hope for it in faith 
and perseverance, trusting that God is faithful to his word and that the promised glory will be a reality. There's one thing we know, like faith, faith is given to us by God. And, and then when we believe, we repent, we are saved, or we receive the spirit. Faith is something that people will say, I lack faith, but you had faith because you're saved. Now you're born again. You've been redeemed. The thing that we have trouble with is hope, I think. Uh, it, it's, it's easy to lose hope. It's easy to have hope crushed or dismantled in front of you in the face of adversity. But one thing that we know is that we, we hope, uh, we still have, we have a hope. We always have a hope that cannot be moved, which is, which is our resurrection. Uh, it's an eternal life with God, the Father, and Jesus. Uh, and Th that is a reality, and we know that. And it's hard to even focus on that sometimes when you're going through suffering, when your trials, seeing all these things happen. It's hard. But ho hope for it in faith and, and perseverance is trusting that God is faithful to his word, and we know that he is. He will bring us through it. And, and at the end of it, because it's inevitable that uh, you know, most of we always say we choose life, but we should just choose and embrace death as well, as, as morbid as that may sound, because it's inevitable. We're all going to pass, and knowing that the hope when that happens is that we will be with the Lord. It's reality. Verses 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray as, for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So when we are weak, we don't, there's time, have you, we've all been in that position. We don't know even how to pray, right? That God himself, the Holy Spirit, helps by making intercession for us, which is amazing, right? And the idea is simply of this communication beyond our ability to express it and that the deep groanings within us cannot be articulated apart from the interceding work of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit's help in intercession then is perfect. We should know that, right? Because he searches, he's searching the hearts of those whom he helps and he is able to guide our prayers according to the will of God. And that's a powerful statement within itself. We could preach on that for a, for a whole sermon, I believe. <laughs> Verse 28 through 30. And we know that for those who, who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. All right, so now we start to get into God's sovereignty here. We start to get into some other controversial things for some people. But God's sovereignty and his ability to manage every aspect of our lives is demonstrated in the fact that all things work together for good to those who love God, that though we, we, we must face suffering, trials, and all these things, that all things work together for good for those who love God. It may not be what you see it or how you think it would end up, but it ends up the way it ends up because it's the way God willed it. So God is able to make even those sufferings work together for our good and his good. And it's for him to be glorified through it. All right. So God is able to work all these things. All right. Notice it says all things, not some things, all things. And he works them for, for good together, not in isolation. And this promise is for those who love God in that biblical understanding of love and that God manages the affairs of our life because we are called according to his purpose. So the eternal, <clears throat> the eternal chain is what it's called of God's working. It's seen in that, the way that was laid out. Foreknew, predestined, 
called, justified, and glorified. That God didn't begin to work in the Romans simply to abandon them in the midst of that present suffering that Paul has mentioned, right? No, he was going to finish that. However, our participation in that eternal plan is reflected in its goal, that, that we might be conformed to the image of a son. And that's a process that God does in us and through us, and this it's part of a sanctification. It's not something that he's just going to do. Like, you know, spiritually on that level, we've said before, in, uh, in Christ, we're in Christ, it's all Jesus. But here, while we're living this life day to day, the reality is to grow, mature, and be sanctified uh, one day at a time. And then he says that, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And that's the reason right here for God's plan, that he adopts us into his family for the purpose of making us like Christ. Similar to him in, uh, in, in the perfection of his humanity. We'll never be perfect, but there's lessons to be learned in how Christ handled himself, the words he spoke, how he uh, approached people, and how he even handled confrontation and confronted people as well, right? So, and, and that's where it's kind of short there. I wanted to just to end there because what we're going to do next time is take a deeper look into those two verses again to get a better grasp on this for the words for new and predestined because we get into that whole topic of predestination and um, all that stuff. And there's some people who don't like that. Other people like it or you just learn to accept it <laughs> or uh, you learn about it and try to, to make sense of it in a biblical way. Uh, and so that's what I'm going to attempt to do to try to explain it to you guys there because it, it gets a little a little muddy in those waters um there especially when we get into ch um to, to chapter nine and uh and you'll get the whole armenian versus calvinism debate going on then too uh and there's, there's a lot of stuff to go over so uh we'll, we'll just take it as as we can and uh i'll just try to make it as simplistic as i can hopefully the lord will help me with that so any questions comments disagreements 